Slow Burn Media, Evergreen Podcasts, and Killer Podcast presents Who Killed, a podcast that provides a voice for the voiceless. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Who Killed. I'm your host, Bill Huffman, and this is a Slow Burn Media, Evergreen Podcast, and Killer Podcast production. This week we are going to cover a couple of cases that are currently in the news, starting with, well, OJ. And then we're going to move on to the case of the Idaho Four and one Brian Koberger's defense and some of the questionable tactics that have been taken up north. And then in part two, we are going to talk about the Delphi case. And again, Matt is a defense attorney and a former prosecutor from Newcastle, Pennsylvania. He is a great uh guy and he's been on the show a number of times to discuss this case or these cases and i think he's very informative so if you guys want to know a little bit more about what's going on with these cases what questions you may have been asking and i try to get to the bottom of some of them so check it out and uh as you know this is uh who killed and this is a Slow Burn Media, Evergreen Podcast, and Killer Podcast Production. Enjoy my conversation with Matt. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Who Killed? I am once again joined by, I guess, our resident expert on law and order, and that would be one Matthew Mangino of the law and crime and many other uh, things in the world of true crime and uh lawyering so welcome back to the show matt hey it's great to be here uh bill uh you know i'm finally a resident expert and man i made it now i'm pretty sure you're a resident expert on uh you know as a talking head and you know you know you know a thing or two about this uh this stuff and uh i would be remiss to say and not acknowledge the breaking news of the day and of course, our listeners will hear this beyond, but the one O.J. Simpson, the notorious O.J. Simpson, has uh, passed away, and uh, cancer did it. And uh, he was really a game changer in the way that true crime is sort of covered. I think you have cases where you know Sam Shepard was a big case, and that was kind of a big national sort of hoopla, and you know it's interesting that F. Lee Bailey was involved with that case and then he eventually became involved with the O.J. Simpson case. It's just um, a legacy. You know, obviously he was a football star, but that was tarnished clearly Mm -hmm. by these uh, murders. You, being a guy who works in the media but is also a practicing attorney, what was the O.J. Simpson case like for your profession and for your what your current profession is as a talking head well you know it's interesting uh, bill you know oj simpson in, in his trial uh you know i look at it as kind of the the father of true crime you know so so you know we're in the in the mid 90s uh early 90s uh, actually and and you know there's you know crime dramas have always been something that people gravitated uh to on on television uh, but this aspect of live trials uh, really started with with O.J. Simpson, where people could tune in literally every day and watch this trial. I, I remember as a young lawyer, uh, you know, our local radio station, you know, every morning I would call in at 8.15 and, and do a little program with the host on, you know, what happened in, in O.J.'s case the day before. I mean, you know, everybody wanted to talk about it and and. You know, you know, and it, it built a lot of careers in, in true crime, uh, you know, in terms of, of commentators and anchors and, and hosts, you know, all, you know, kind of got their 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 feet wet in the O.J. Simpson case because it was just live and yeah. in your face all the time. Uh, and, and so, um, you know, I, I think, you know, that that attraction to to live trials and. You know, it, it, it certainly helped that O.J. Simpson was a huge uh, personality. And, and as you said, I mean, you know, he wasn't just, you know, a good football player. I mean, he was a, a Hall of Famer, a great football player, you know, one of the greatest of all time. And then he transitioned into, you know, acting and, and uh, you know, color commentary and, and football games. I mean, 
I mean, he was a, a legend and a household name long before uh, this whole crime that he was accused of and ultimately acquitted of. Yeah, you know, he was a pitch man for Hertz. I mean, he was an NBA or NBC football analyst. He was very much in the public eye. And to put it sort of like, an, I guess, in a contemporary uh, perspective, it would sort of be like um, if Patrick Mahomes killed his wife or something crazy yeah. like that you know like his level of superstardom was really unprecedented and he did transition well he had a lot of issues clearly that we didn't know about until the trial and you know maybe people in the community knew about it but obviously it didn't prevent him from being hired at those places and you know i'm one thing i'm glad is that you know mr goldman you know kind of can see um at least you know he knows oj's dead and um you know his sister and i you know it's just one of those things which you just can't be in this industry and not look back at as sort of a watershed moment in um the way that court cases mm -hmm. and true crime are covered and again you think about like the case, the names that you brought up it's like greta van susteren uh Nancy Grace, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of these people, like they were getting their feet wet basically with this case. And I mean, when you said, and this is just, you know, just a random thing, but like when the trial was concluded and the verdict was read, what, I mean, were you absolutely shocked? Well, I mean, you know, it, it had gone on uh, so long. Uh, and, you know, don't, you know, we, we, we can't lose sight of the fact that, you know, the, the trial was long. But, I mean, if you remember, Bill, and I'm sure you do, I mean, the preliminary hearing lasted three months. I mean, sometimes, you know, I've been involved in, in homicide preliminary hearings that lasted 45 minutes. This one lasted months. Uh, and, and that was just the beginning of the case. And, and then, you know, this whole idea of DNA, uh, you know, th you know, th that term you know, became a common household term because of the O.J. Simpson trial. I mean, you know, people who were following closely, you know, science and biology and everything and genetics and everything that goes into it, or, you know, people who were aware that DNA, you know, could be a crime solver or could be an exonerator in, in crime. If you weren't, if you weren't watching closely, you didn't, you, you, DNA was introduced to you by, uh, Barry Sheck in, in the O.J. Simpson case, um, you know, so 100%. so it did, you know, it did really, uh, you know, have an impact on the public. And then, you know, things that we that we still know today. I mean, you know, my children who were 23 years old, you know, we were talking earlier about the O.J. Simpson trial. And, you know, my son says something to the effect of, you know, if it, if it doesn't fit, you must acquit, you know. Uh, and he, he was born, you know, years after the O.J. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, th those those lines from 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 the trial, you know, ended, entered into, you know, uh, you know, our our common language and things that we know and, and still talk Kato about. Kato Kalin. Today. Right. Yeah. I mean, nothing I mean, was better than Kato Kalin moving in close to the microphone and saying, yes. I mean, that, that's classic stuff. Uh, I, it, it, it really was. And, you know, I guess the biggest trial before that was the Menendez brothers. And then they were having their retrial during mm -hmm. the OJ trial or parts of the OJ trial. And, you know, again, that's just one of those cases where just wild publicity. Right. But yeah, it's, uh, I just wanted to see what your thoughts were on, um, that case and what it was like as a, as an attorney. And again, the fact that you, you couldn't go anywhere without it being on TV. I, I saw something online today earlier where they they were talking about a Sopranos uh, episode where he goes back and, you know, it's one of those dream episodes, mm -hmm. not the best ones, but like whatever, there's parts that are always good and redeeming, but there is a part where Tony goes back in time or goes back in time in his dream. And they're showing the OJ Simpson trial at the bar at the airport. And it's like, that's pretty much how it was. Right, right. That's really what it was like. Yeah. I it, mean, I remember sitting in my high school class when the, when the verdict was read and it was just like such a weird reaction. Like some people were, like, I don't know. It was just an odd time and time that really changed what we do as 
and, 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 you know, you know, the working in this business. Thing is, and I know you're you're a Cleveland guy, right? I yeah. am. Yes. So, so I was at a Cleveland Browns game when I heard that the verdict was coming in in the O.J. Simpson case, and and I and I believe, if I'm not mistaken, it was the last season of Municipal Stadium in Cleveland. Um, that would have been correct. Right. Yes, nineteen ninety-five. And so, and I, and, but I remember that. Uh, that's where I was. I'm like, oh man. I mean, I, I love being at a, a game, but I need to. I need to get some quick information about what's going on with this uh, verdict. But, but yeah, you, so it was kind of one of those things you remember where you were when you heard uh, about the O.J. Simpson verdict. Yeah, and I, and I remember where I was when it was first announced that he was a suspect yeah. in the, in the murders and that. He was a fugitive mm -hmm. and it was just like I was at the pool with my sister and just I mean, it's just such like a weird thing that those those moments stick with you because like you had said before, he was more than just a football player. He was sort of a public figure and yeah, he, he was he was a public figure. So, I mean, we all know where if the one exists, he's probably there. So um, I'm just glad that uh the families can just move on and yeah and you know you can never move on from a horrific thing like that but right. for the goldmans and for the browns um it's a it's a good day for them right. so yeah yeah <laughs> and so you know that wasn't actually what we originally came on to talk about today because that just happened within the past few hours so uh what we actually were going to talk about is First and foremost, the case in Idaho, just north of me here in Denver. Uh, I guess not just north, but, you know, north enough. And uh, there's been a lot of stuff going on with the Coburger case and the Idaho 4. Can you really, can you catch us up to date on what's been going on and what, like, the latest reveals have, or the court proceedings have revealed? Well, you know, the, the latest thing, um, uh, Bill, that, that, that's really um kind of strange is this whole issue with this sort of mock questionnaire or survey uh, that uh, the defense has sent out uh, to, you know, prospective jurors. Uh, you know, I, I can see, uh, you know, there's a lot of different techniques that are used when you're using some sort of jury, uh, juror consultant to, to help you pick a jury. Um, and there's a lot of you know, you, you can do things like uh, focus groups and things like that and mock juries, which give you some idea of whether or not your uh, opening statement is, has any impact or, or what issues that jurors, uh, you know, connect to uh, in these focus group or mock uh, jury uh, pools. But, you know, I, I don't think I've uh, ever seen anything like this before where you where you're sending out you know, uh, you know, mock questionnaires, you know, typically what happens is when someone's summoned for jury duty in most jurisdictions, they'll get a written questionnaire that they'll have to go through and fill out. And then you use that questionnaire as a, as, as a prosecutor or a defense attorney, you know, to help, uh, you know, find out more about this person and maybe expand on some questions that you would want to ask uh, during uh, voir dire. You know, but here, you know, this mock questionnaire, I'm not sure what the purpose of it would be. I mean, I guess it would be to get some sort of uh, flavor for people who have already made up their mind about this case. And maybe you'd want to use it uh, for a change of uh, venue or a change of veneer. I'm not I'm not sure how it helps you in, in the process of of picking a jury. And, and I can see where if I were prosecuting this case, you know, I would want to look closely at this survey and the questions that were asked because, you know, could this be an effort to contaminate the jury pool? Now, I'm not saying that was what the intention is, uh, but I certainly would be concerned about that if I'm on the other side of this questionnaire and I'd want to know exactly how these questions were being asked. Uh, obviously, you know, it alarmed at least one person to, to go forward to the authorities and say, hey, I, I taped this, uh, these questions in this survey because they concerned me. And, and uh, so, so that's going to be an interesting issue 
uh, in uh, Idaho. Yeah, you know, that that was something that definitely stood out as, like, I can understand them using that potentially for a change of venue, saying, look, mm -hmm. we can't get a fair trial here. Uh, but again, does it do any service for the client at the end of the day, other than maybe delay? Um, you know, that's... Uh, I guess we've talked about this before and in the past we've talked about this and it's the defense's job to do whatever they can for their client. So I'm not going to question, I mean, I can you can question and I can question their motives and their act, actions. But again, like you've said in the past, they are doing what they can. Now, is this something that would f fall into like a violation of some sort or is this something that just muddies the waters yeah, you know, I don't know if it's a violation of of any, you know, ethical standard. I mean, a, as you said, and in, in as you you indicated, we've talked about in the past. I mean, defense attorneys have to zealously represent their clients, and they have to do everything that they possibly can to make sure that they get a fair and impartial trial. Now, you know, that's what a change of venue uh, is all about. Okay, it's about being able to impanel. A, a jury that can be fair and impartial. It doesn't mean that you have to pick 12 jurors who don't know anything about this case and never heard of Kohlberger. I mean, personally, if I was trying the case on either side of the table and someone come in in Utah and said, hey, I never heard of Kohlberger, I don't think I want that guy on my, on my jury. I mean, where's he been? Uh, under a rock, um, you know, for the last, you know, couple of years. So, so it's not it's a fair point. the fact that you don't know anything. Yeah, it's not the fact that you don't know anything about this or you never read anything about it or you never watched anything about it. It's whether or not you can set aside what you've read, what you've heard, what you've observed, and still be a fair and impartial juror. That's what picking a jury is all about. It's not about, you know, when you're looking for a change of uh, venue, it's not about, hey, have you heard about this case? It's whether you can be fair and impartial, even though you have heard about it or read about it. And that makes sense. And in that regard, like, what is the, um, what's with the delay? I mean, we're, we're talking about years again. I mean, I know this is a big case and obviously four lives were lost and these families want justice. And we've already just talked about the OJ Simpson trial and how long that took. Mm -hmm. Um, what are your thoughts on how this is progressing? Is it, is this a normal pace? Is this uh slow? Is this, you know, what's going on here? Well, you know, if you remember at the outset, you know, the defense, they wanted to enforce the speedy trial rule. They wanted this case to go to trial in a matter of months, uh, you know, which, uh, you know, I, I, I thought was crazy and, and you know, probably a, a bluff and ultimately it was, uh, I mean, there, there are so many issues that are going to come up in, in this case uh, pre-trial. Uh, some of them have already come up. You know, there are going to be more issues. There's going to be more examination of evidence. There's going to be more motions to exclude uh, evidence and, and, and other things. You know, there's going to be continued ongoing investigation. I mean, you know, we know, you know, that this case is about, you know, really four major things. We know that there's a sheath that has Kohlberger's DNA on it. We know that there's videotape of his vehicle uh, in the area. And we know that there is um, cell phone records of him being in and about these areas when these crimes were committed or, or had frequented that area prior to that. You know, so, so you know, that's what these cases are about. You know, we, we know we have a, a witness uh, who was in the mm -hmm. house, who survived, right. who, who, you know, really wasn't able to uh, identify who this person was that was in the house and, you know, didn't immediately, you know, call the authorities or, or, or anybody else uh, with regard to that. So, so I mean, there, there's, there's a lot going on in this case. And there's a lot that's going to continue to go on. So, so I could see because of the, the magnitude of the case, 
uh, and, the, and the, as we said earlier, the zealous representation uh, of defense counsel that there, there are going to be delays and there's going to continue to be delays. Yeah, there are. And it it is an interesting um, case in the sense that the charges are four counts of murder. Now, a lot of the times, and I've seen the discourse on social media, is that he was supposedly stalking potentially one of the victims. Mm-hmm. Um, he was not charged with stalking. Is that something that you see as uh, an issue, or is that just something that they just figured we're going for the the murders and not anything else? Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I don't know that, uh, that you know, stalking necessarily needs to be a part of this case, even if he if he was uh, stalking him. That, that, that certainly uh, would would give some rise to the issue of uh, motive. You know, he maybe he had some infatuation with one of the victims that, that led to this horrendous act, although you don't even have to give a reason or a motive why, uh, you know, he, he did what he did if, in fact, he did it, who somebody did it. And, and you don't you don't have to you don't have to attach a motive to why you know somebody would have created uh, or, or committed such a heinous uh, heinous crime, um, you know. So I, I don't look at that as necessarily a shortcoming. It's still relevant evidence, uh, even if you don't you know trying to prove it uh, beyond a reasonable doubt. Right, and that's a, and that's fair. I mean, if I'm a prosecutor, I think that would be something that I'd be more focused on as far as just using it as evidence, but yeah, what's the charge, you know, the additional charge going to really do. And do you have any questions about the prosecutors? Like, I mean, have you had, has there been any, any moments where you thought, you know, I wouldn't have done it that way or, or is this just all driven by the defense? Well, I, I think a lot of, of, pre-trial matters are, are driven by the defense, okay? Because what happens is, you know, the prosecution, um, you know, they, they work with the police, they work with investigators, uh, they put their case together. Um, and, you know, uh, ultimately, in order to arrest somebody, you have to have probable cause, okay? So it's, it's more likely than not that, that a crime was committed. Obviously, a terrible crime was committed. And that this is the person who committed it. You know, it's it's far from beyond a reasonable doubt, uh, which is a which is this you know the ultimate standard at a criminal trial. And, and you can continue to hold somebody just based on probable cause. Okay, you know, so so you don't have, you know, so so in Pennsylvania, what we refer to it uh, in, in a preliminary hearing is is proving a, a prima facie case. Okay, so. That's a standard where maybe, you know, it, it's still probable cause, but, you know, it's enough for a, a, a magistrate or a decision maker to hear uh, at the outset and say, OK, this case has enough evidence to move on to trial. And then, you know, ultimately you, you move forward uh, in, in that direction. So so the prosecution, yeah, they're going to their investigators are going to continue working. They're going to continue digging. They're going to. You know they're going to follow up on leads. I'm sure they're still getting tips and other things as this case uh, continues. Uh, but you know their case is sort of out front. I mean, here's the criminal complaint. Here's the indictment. Here's the evidence that we present uh, preliminarily to detain you. Um, you know the defense is churning all this other stuff. Uh, you know whether you know it's through pretrial motions. You know, and it can be a lot of different things. You know, suppression motions. Uh, you know, other constitutional, uh, issues that you, that, that you could raise, uh, prior to trial, like we talked about a change of, of venue and, and things like that. And, you know, and, and, and basically, you know, try to test their case pre-trial, you know, push it to the limit to test the prosecution's case pre-trial. Yeah. And, you know, like we had talked and you had mentioned before about them pushing for the speedy trial, I think, you know, I would guess that that's a tactic on their end to try to get to the state to prove their case. I mean, is that something you ever did when you were prosecuting? Did or in in your defense because you've moved on to being becoming a defense attorney? Yeah. Um, is that something that you've ever 
been successful at doing, or is that something that is just more of a tactic? You know, I think it's more than a tact. It's more of a tactic than anything else. Um, you know, because you're taking a real risk uh, as a defense attorney to try to push your case. Certainly, your client sitting in jail, and you know he or she doesn't want to be sitting in jail. Uh, but you're taking a risk, okay? Because you know the law has evolved with regard to defense attorneys. Um, you know, in the past, the standard was: Did your client get a fair trial? So, regardless of what you did pre-trial, uh, you know, maybe you just stumbled into the courtroom on the day of the trial, um, you know, two months after the trial occurred, and and said, "Hey, we're ready to go. We want we want this case to go forward because of the speedy trial." You're taking a chance um, because. Now, representing a, a defendant is much more than just making sure they get a fair trial. OK, you know, there, there have been there have been a couple of um, Supreme Court cases. Um, yeah, I say recently, but time goes by so fast anymore. But, you know, um, that Lafler and Fry are the names of the two cases. And what Lafler and Fry stand for is, hey, you know, 98 percent of cases end up as plea bargains. OK, so it's not enough for a defense attorney to try to ensure that a defendant gets a fair trial because most cases don't end up in a fair trial. So now, you know, you're responsible for, you know, did you did you try to get a plea offer? Did you negotiate a plea offer? Did you communicate that plea offer to your client? Uh, did you file pretrial motions that might have resulted in the case getting it uh, getting dismissed? Uh, you know, did you do all these things for your client? you know, pre-trial. Uh, and, and so, so you know, sort of the face of criminal defense, you know, collateral consequences of crime. You know, so, you know, you, know, you don't often think of, and attorneys, defense attorneys really didn't have any responsibility in the past to say, hey, you know, if you get convicted of this crime, your license gets suspended for a year. Or if you're convicted of a felony, you won't be able to vote. Or if you're convicted of a felony, you can't coach your little league baseball team, or you can't get a student loan, or you can't get a license to be a nurse. If you don't tell your client about those collateral consequences of crime, that might be ineffective assistance of counsel. So, so the face of criminal defense has changed dramatically. And, and so to get back to your point, that speedy trial rule, if you're trying to race under the gun with that speedy trial rule, you're increasing the chances that you're going to make a mistake that you're going to be ineffective in, in representing your client, and this case is going to come back on you at some point. I guess in my next question would be, would a defense attorney, and I'm sure this has happened in the past, now would they do that to sort of give them an out for poor representation and poor representation in an appeal? Uh, like, mean, would they be able to bring that up? Yeah. Would they, would they be able to say, mm -hmm. well, you know, my attorney was completely unprepared and, you know, they wanted the speedy yeah. trial. Oh, yeah. and, well, you know, we went through the speedy trial and I'm guilty and now I want to appeal, yeah. appeal it because I don't like my representation. Is that something that even would get past? A, oh, yeah. 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 I mean, so, so, so typically the way that, that happens is you, you know, you, you go through a trial, you get convicted. After you're convicted, you have direct appeal um, availability. So, so here in Pennsylvania, we have an intermediate appellate court, the superior court. So you can you have an automatic right to appeal your your conviction. After that automatic right, if your conviction is sustained, you can then ask for collateral relief. Okay, post conviction relief. Uh, and that's where you can raise ineffective assistance of counsel. That's when you can say, hey, I went to trial and I got five to 10 years, but the DA made an offer of 18 months to 36 months. And my lawyer never told me if he would have told me 18 to 36, I would have taken it. That's ineffective assistance of counsel. And you can you can get a new trial for that. So there's a lot of cases that come back uh, on collateral relief, post conviction relief, where You've alleged that your client, I mean, that your lawyer didn't adequately represent you. Yeah, you know, to me, it seems like um, if they would have gotten that speedy trial, or in my view, because I'm not a lawyer and I'm, this is from a layman's mm -hmm. perspective, that if they did do that, 
in cases, certain cases, not just the Koberger case and the Idaho four, is that mm -hmm. they just know their clients so guilty that they're just going to throw everything they can, you know, the, in the kitchen sink at this thing, even if it's at the detriment of their own career. Yeah. Well, I hope that that isn't the case for most lawyers, um, you know, because they're, they're you know, there's, there's really a, an important responsibility uh, for defense attorneys. And, and, and that responsibility is to ensure that their clients' constitutional rights uh, are being safeguarded. OK, so, so, you know, you may think your client's guilty, um, but you still have a responsibility to make sure that the prosecution doesn't use inadmissible evidence to convict him or, or you know, other means that are unconstitutional. Uh, because here's what happens, Bill, and I, and I know you, you understand this, and I'm sure um, most of your uh, viewers and listeners do too, but as corny as it sounds, if we start walking into court and saying, well, my guy's guilty, what's the difference, what happens? You know, there's going to be a day when your guy isn't guilty, but because you didn't strenuously fight these issues in the past, they're foreclosed to your client now, and a guilty person gets convicted. You know, unless we're out there zealously fighting to preserve those constitutional rights, all of us are in jeopardy if we start saying, hey, he's guilty, so what? You know, push him down the river. I mean, that, that, that's, you know, and I take it seriously. I think it's extremely important that we, we need, especially in this political climate that, that we live in, in this, this sort of embracing of authoritarianism, we need to protect those constitutional rights now more than we ever had and more zealously than we ever had. Yeah, I can't agree with that more. And with that, I want to hear your final two cents on the uh, the Idaho case as it currently stands. And what, what should we expect to see next? Yeah. Well, like, like we said, I think we're going we're gonna to see some more court action. We're, we're going to see some more uh, pretrial matters uh, that are going to come to the forefront here. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm really interested to see, you know, what the court does with this survey questionnaire sort of uh, mock survey of, uh, of potential jurors. I mean, it, it's, it's an interesting, like I said, I, I, don't, I haven't really heard of that in the past and maybe I'm, I'm missing something, but, but I'd be real interested to see how the court deals with that issue. All right. Well, that's always interesting. And I love to hear your perspective on this stuff because it's definitely uh, above my uh, education level as far as uh, practicing law goes. And that will do it for part one of my conversation with Matt Mangino. And as you guys know, I drop new episodes every Friday on wherever you get your favorite podcasts. And again, part two is coming right up. So that will be covering the uh, Delphi case. And again, thank you to Matt for taking his time out of his busy schedule and joining me on Who Killed. If you want to follow me on Twitter, you can do so at BillHuffman3. And otherwise, as always, until next time, stay healthy and be safe. Hi, podcast listeners. I'm Carol Costello, a former CNN anchor and national correspondent. This January, I'm launching a podcast about one of the first cases I ever covered as a journalist. It's one that stuck with me all of these years, the one that buried itself under my skin and stayed put. It's a true crime series about an amazing woman named Phyllis Cottle who defied torture and death and brought a fierce rage to the quest to find her attacker. Carol Costello Presents Blind Rage is a production of Evergreen Podcasts and signature title of the Killer Podcast Network. Listen and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Discover more great true crime and paranormal programming at killerpodcast.com. 24 hours ago, I found out the person I'd been dating and seeing for the last six months as a con man. That is my sister, Emma. Andrew Tonks's lies had been so convincing, she'd invested $300,000 with him. However, the tables were about to turn on Andrew. 
What he didn't know was that Emma had discovered his real identity. But to get any chance of justice, Emma had to act like it was business as usual. Coming up in this series, and that's when murder, all this stuff goes through my mind. I'm really, really scared. I'm assuming Sarah has watched too much Netflix and figures I've been defrauding you. Couldn't be further from the truth. That's what this was, a real life story that seems so unbelievable, but it was actually true. A true story that all starts with one simple swipe to the right. I'm Sarah Ferris. And I'm Emma Ferris. And this is my story, Conning the Con. <laughs> 